I know all the ins and outs of what, of what I'm doing. I know, you know, about all the contracts and all the deals I'm about to do. I'm not just some girl who's listening to my manager and saying, oh yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that. Welcome back to Brittany Lore. There are two primary reasons I wanted to do this series. Number one, I just have like way too much knowledge about Britney Spears that I need to do something with. And then two, I just think Britney Spears as an artist and as a public figure is way more interesting and almost kind of punk rock than people give her credit for. An example of that being our next piece of Britney lore, her six show long House of Blues tour from spring of 2007, the M&M's tour. Mariah Carey, <laughs> say three nice things about Eminem. <laughs> Talented, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular, never the same, totally unique, completely not ever been done before, unafraid to reference or not reference, put it in a blender, shit on it, vomit on it, eat it, give birth to it. Very good. Oh my God, I love it. A lot of what I find so fascinating about Britney is in all the dichotomies her career encompasses. In 1998, she started her career overcoming a sort of Madonna whore complex, exuding obviously intentional sex appeal in her work while also publicly claiming to be abstinent. Alongside that, while she came into the business as a 16-year-old, handling the workload of an adult and constantly being praised for her professionality and maturity at such a young age, much of her early marketing purposefully emphasized her youth even while sexualizing her. Like with the infamous Rolling Stone cover of 1999, taken when Britney was just 17 years old. It showed her posing seductively in what's basically lingerie while holding a Teletubby in her childhood bedroom. Is this your actual room? That's my room, and this is the collection of all my dolls. You have a collection of dolls? Yes, I do. And quite an extensive collection of dolls, yes. I might add. To me, though, perhaps the most meaningful dichotomy of Britney's career is in the juxtaposition between Britney Spears the manufactured pop star and Britney Spears the artist who's often far more creatively innovative and rebellious than people usually talk about. Especially in the early stages of her career, there is certainly merit to the manufactured pop star angle. She has no songwriting credits on her first album, which is fine. Plenty of the biggest, most influential artists of all time don't write all their own music. But it is a little telling that every single track on Baby One More Time was written by adult men, often adult Swedish men, specifically writing from the perspective of an American teenage girl. If you've ever wondered why the lyrics Hit Me Baby One More Time sound so weird when you really think about them, it was because Hit Me Baby was a Swedish man's warped conception of the American phrase Hit Me Up. Long before the controversial conservatorship put in place on Britney in 2008, there were a lot of hands involved in shaping the pop persona of Britney Spears. That doesn't mean that Britney herself wasn't actually responsible for her own success. Sure, she's never been a vocal powerhouse, but she does have a vocal prowess that is very particular to her. Even at just 16, she had impeccable instincts in terms of the inflection she put on words and the very purposeful little breaths she adds between phrases. Oh, baby, baby, the reason I breathe is you. And Britney can get away with lip syncing so much in her performances because she's so supremely skilled as a dancer and performer. She's literally just fun to watch, and she's always displayed a keen understanding of her own audience. The Baby One More Time video, for example, was her idea. The original concept was some sort of cartoon-like Power Rangers-ish thing, but Britney really didn't like that. I mean, for instance, Britney's Baby One More Time, she, I wrote a treatment which she hated, and she said, I, I want to be in a schoolroom with a load of cute boys, so that was pretty much the brief and uh, you know my initial reaction is 
hang on, I've got a 16 year old girl telling me what to do. And then I suddenly realized, well, maybe the 16 year old girl has a better perspective on what she wants to, she and her peers want to see. A lot of the most memorable moments from Britney's career were her ideas. There might have been a lot of other people making decisions for her along the way, but she's pretty clearly been fighting to be a creative lead in her work for a long time. And that was probably pretty hard for someone who came into the business as a literal child. From 1998 until 2008, with Britney's increasing personal autonomy, also came an increased control that she exercised over her own professional output. She went from zero writing credits on Baby One More Time, to one writing credit on Oops I Did It Again, then five on her self-titled, six if you count the deluxe edition, then on In The Zone, she was credited as a writer for a majority of the tracks. She had less writing credits on Blackout, but she is credited as the executive producer for the entire album. At the very beginning of 2004, Britney stunned the nation when she decided to get hitched in Vegas to a friend from her hometown, dressed in ripped jeans and a baseball cap. Now that hometown friend turned out to be a QAnon-leaning stalker who made an appearance outside the Capitol on January 6, 2021, and an appearance at Britney's wedding in 2022, uninvited and wielding a knife. So, okay, not the greatest decision that Britney's ever made, but an understandable one when examining the kind of tight control she had been put under prior to that moment. She later described the quickie wedding as an act of rebellion. Maybe that sounds silly, but in in that moment, I was just, um, I was with a friend and I, that I love dearly, and I wanted to do something wild and crazy, and um, I wanted to get married, so that's why I did it. Later that year, Britney suffered a knee injury on the set of her never-finished music video for her song Outrageous. The injury put a pause on her Onyx Hotel tour, and around the same time, she met back backup dancer Kevin Federline. She and Kevin started filming a short-lived reality series called Britney and Kevin Chaotic. Let's get crazy! It was less like a structured reality TV show, though, and more like a messy collection of home videos filmed by a camcorder. They look like boobs, but they're not. They're my knees. <laughs> They're my knees. Now, Chaotic will eventually have to be an episode all its own, but it is a little important to the overall narrative here. So in June of 2004, the Onyx Hotel tour is officially canceled. In September of 2004, Brittany and Kevin get married. How did he propose? Can I ask that? Or is that too much? It might be a no. I propose. You propose? Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> The mythos of BritneySpears.com will also have to be its own video someday, but what's important right now is that toward the end of 2004, Britney started posting letters of truth to her website. These were essentially just blog posts that she published on and off for a few years. And in October of 2004, she wrote a post saying, I am also going to take some time off to enjoy life. I've actually learned to say no. With this newly found freedom, it's like people don't know how to act around me. Should we talk to her like we did when she was just 16, or like the icon everyone says she is? My prerogative right now is to just chill and let all the other overexposed blondes on the cover of Us Weekly be your entertainment. Good luck, girls. I'm sorry that my life seemed like it was all over the place the last two years. It's probably because it was. I understand now what they mean when they talk about child stars. Going and going and going is all I've ever known since I was 15 years old. It's amazing what advisors will push you to do, even if it means taking a naive young blonde girl and putting her on the cover of every magazine. On November 1st, Britney released her first greatest hits collection, aptly titled My Prerogative. You can't tell me what to do. A week later, she posted another letter of truth, writing, I haven't really thought a lot about work lately. What better time for a Greatest Hits album to come out? I can actually enjoy and reflect on my success at this point in my life. 
I may be disappointing some fans out there, but I don't think I'll do another tour for a couple years. My priorities in life have changed. I am having fun again, reading all the magazines that I enjoy, mainly because I'm not on them. At this point in time, what I want is not my face on every corner, but someone else's instead. I really want to help other people achieve their dreams and possibly even develop new artists. Everything is in the very beginning stages, and it feels great to just think about different opportunities that I'm interested in pursuing. Now, one of the songs on my prerogative was a track called Do Something. Why don't you do something? The music video for which Britney choreographed and co-directed under the name Mona Lisa. Do Something was never really a smash hit, but I think it pretty well encapsulates a lot of the artistic decisions that Britney was making around that time. It's very pop, but also kind of quirky, especially with Britney's vocal inflections, which were starting to get a little bit more eccentric. There are a lot of deeper album tracks where Britney sings in a similar style. For instance, the song Mmm Poppy on the Circus album. Or the chaotic theme song. I mean, you know how it is, rockin' and rollin' and whatnot. Some people don't like it, but I do. The larger point is, though, that there are these sort of idiosyncrasies in Britney's work that were starting to get more prominent from, like, 2004 to 2008. There's these little things she does that still work within the very accessible pop music she's known for, but that show off Britney's more distinct personality. You see that with the Do Something video, too. Aspects of it are very feminine, as Britney's always represented a sort of traditional femininity. There's lots of pink, Britney's got her signature crop top, she has a little Hello Kitty necklace. It's very femme, but also kind of trashy, in like a fun way. As had come to be expected by that point, Brit's sexuality is on display, but not in a way that's particularly sensual. Rather, it's kind of aggressive. Like instead of inviting you to engage in sexual acts with her, she's daring you to. It's just kind of awesome and a far cry from I was born to make you happy. In 2005, Brit published another letter of truth saying, I think I should rephrase myself from my previous letters when I was talking about taking a break. What I meant was, I was taking a break from being told what to do. True masters say it's cool when you look at someone and don't know whether they're at work or at play since it's all the same to them. The things I've been doing for work lately have been so much fun because it's not like work to me anymore. I've been even more hands-on in my management and the business side of things, and I feel more in control than ever. I just shot a cute video for Do Something that I co-directed. After doing about 20 videos, it gets kind of boring playing the same role. As much fun as I had, I have to say I was a little disappointed that I still had to convince my record label that making this video was the right thing to do at this time. But in the end, I think everything came out great. Co-directing this video was like an experimental project for me. I feel like being behind the camera is sometimes more satisfying than being in front of it. Working on this video was my first taste into behind the scenes work, which I am excited about doing more of in the near future. When a woman directs, I think it just alters the entire feel of the movie, production, or play in such a positive way. Speaking of, I've been working on writing and hopefully eventually directing a musical which makes fun of the whole Hollywood scene, which is appropriately titled Hollywood. So that was January 2005. But starting sometime in 2004, Britney was working on what's now called her lost album, The Original Doll. On December 30th, 2004, Brit literally walked into a radio station with a CD to play the demo of her then-upcoming track, Mona Lisa. Good luck with your album. It's untitled. It's untitled. It's probably going to be called The Original Doll, so... And it's half done? Yeah, it's halfway done right now. All right, so maybe by the summer? Maybe yeah. by the fall? Yeah, maybe a little bit earlier. All right, and I know, I know everybody's going to want to hear the new single over and over, so I'm going to try to play as much as I can, okay? The new Mona Lisa. Hot. It's just a taste. Go ahead, darling. This is Mona Lisa, and it's number one. Number one. Yeah. Number one. That was her name. 102.7 Kiss FM. 
The album was never completed because, allegedly, Britney's record label didn't think it would fit her image, nor did they appreciate her playing unfinished demos to a radio station without their permission. Again, that's a topic for a different video, but I bring all of this up to draw your attention to the increased autonomy of Britney Spears, both privately and professionally. During this era, she was directing her own videos and getting hitched in Vegas without anybody's approval, whether that was a good idea or not. Along with that, there's an increased DIY appeal of Britney's output. She was filming reality shows with camcorders, communicating directly with fans through her letters of truth, and walking down to a radio station with a CD to play the rough demo of a song her label hadn't even approved of yet. Then in 2006, other than the reality show and the EP that soundtracked it, which is where the final version of Mona Lisa was eventually stuffed, Britney's career hadn't been super active, but People magazine was reporting that she was ready to get back into music, with Britney apparently saying, This may sound weird, but I miss traveling. I miss the road, seeing different places, and being with the dancers and having fun. That feeling of being on the stage, knowing it's your best, I love that. I needed a break. I needed to be hungry again. After that, Britney obviously went through some shit. She got divorced, lost a close family member to cancer, became estranged from other members of her family, learned about her teen sister's pregnancy through paparazzi. My sister's not pregnant. And then eventually, the day before my 11th birthday, she shaved her head. And about a month before that incident, Britney posted a note to her website saying, It has been a while since I've addressed you personally here on my official website. The last couple of years have been quite a ride for me. The media has criticized my every move and printed a skewed perception of who I really am as a human being. Behind every decision I have made in my public life, there always seems to be an apparent contradiction. I have to come to terms with that, which is why I usually don't pay much attention to it. The last couple of years have been very enlightening for me, and now that I've had the time to be me, I've been able to sit down and think about where I want to go with myself as an entertainer with absolutely no strings attached. I am now more mature and feel like I am finally free. Oof. I've been working so hard on this new album and I can't wait for you all to hear it and to go on tour again. I would like to exclusively tell you that I am working hard to release the new album sometime later this year, but the date is of course not certain yet. I look forward to coming back this year bigger and better than ever, and to also reach out to my fans on a more personal level. Then there was a brief stint in rehab, preceded by allegations, or at least suspicion, of heavy alcohol and drug use. And of course, all that is not really anyone's business, but it does paint a picture of about where Britney was at around this era, where there was some concerning behavior that seemed to indicate a deeper problem. She was still estranged from members of her family, and at some point during this time, also started splitting from longtime members of her profession team. On April 17th, 2007, Britney fired Larry Rudolph, her manager since she was 16 years old. On April 26th, 2007, she was scheduled to perform a surprise set at the Burlesque Club 40 Deuce. She apparently attended rehearsals for the performance the night prior, with the club's owner saying, She came on stage during rehearsal, looking very hot. The choreography was smoking, and she sounded great. The owner also stated, however, that the show had been postponed because management decided it wasn't the right time. And to that I have to ask, what management? The People Magazine article about this even says, it's the first time hearing about it, said a rep for Spears. Which like, first time they're hearing about the show or the cancellation? At some point around the spring or summer of 2007, Britney met Sam Lutby, who would later claim to have worked as Britney's manager for a bit. But there was never any sort of physical contract between the two, and Britney has never spoken about Sam super directly. So it's literally just his word, which I don't fully trust. And then in August, there were reports about Britney hiring some guy named Jeff, who I guess 
used to manage Kelly Clarkson to be her manager, but then he quit like a month later, so I, I don't know. Regardless, Sam Letby said that he started working as Britney's manager in June, and Britney fired Larry Rudolph mid-April. So from mid-April until the end of May? I don't know who was managing Britney Spears. My best guess? is Britney Spears. And that's important, because the same day that People magazine was reporting that Britney had canceled this surprise performance at 40 Deuce, we started seeing reports that Britney was scheduled to perform at various House of Blues venues the next week under the band name The M&Ms. There was no official announcement, just three shows listed on Ticketmaster for The M&Ms at the House of Blues in San Diego, Anaheim, and the Sunset Strip from May 1st to the 3rd. Celeb Slam was the first site that I could find who started spreading the claim that the M&Ms was Britney. And about 12 hours later, Just Jared was publishing photos of Britney outside a dance studio, supposedly rehearsing for the shows. And I need to emphasize how weird this all would have been. After her first album was released in 1999, when Britney was 17 years old, she quickly moved from mall tours and performing as the opening act for NSYNC to headlining tours in arenas with capacities of at least 10,000 people, more or less. Usually, more. These were shows with big productions, props, segments, pyrotechnics, carefully crafted costumes and makeup design, big spectacles with big budgets, and earnings of like tens of millions of dollars. And then suddenly, after not performing for years, one of the biggest pop stars in the world was scheduling herself, with it seems no management whatsoever, a mini House of Blues tour. Under a different name, with no promo and no real announcement, where the largest venue had just over a 2,000 capacity limit, and most venues had about 1,000. Also, the tickets only cost $35. Granted, once people realized that it was probably Britney performing, resale prices could go as high as like $500, but the venues themselves only charging $35. Of course, there didn't seem to be much of a budget for the show. It was just four backup dancers, no band, the music was courtesy of a CD with a few Britney tracks burned onto them, which reportedly started skipping during Do Something during one of the shows. And the only real prop on stage was a chair. I also presume that the outfits Britney wore on stage, which included a plain pink bra, a bedazzled pink bra, a white mini skirt, a denim mini skirt, white go-go boots, fishnets, and either a brown or blonde wig with a plain black headband over it, was probably just all stuff Britney already had. Each show ran about 13 to 20 minutes long, with a track list of five songs. In total, she performed six shows, three in Southern California, one in Las Vegas, and two in Florida. And that was it. She lip synced, obviously. There were times where she was apparently chewing gum on the stage, and she may or may not have been about two hours late for the first show. And it was fucking incredible. On May 3rd, a review from the LAist gave a review of the third show, writing, People paid hard-earned money for tickets, for a performance that would only last 15 to 18 minutes from a performer who chews gum as she lip syncs. And they ate it up. How did Brit dance? Eh. How did she look? Eh. How did we like it? We loved it. There was an energy in that place that we've not experienced in a very long time. It was the beginning of a new beginning, a celebration that our little knucklehead had made it through a troubling time in her life, and a reminder that Britney Spears isn't a full-time gossip magazine cover girl. She's an entertainer, sorta. Whatever she is, she belongs on stage, and it was very nice to have her back there. MTV wrote of the show, it was as though Britney had invited 900 friends to her dirty little dance party, and too bad for you if you couldn't roll with the fun. At the height of Britney's troubles, just two short months ago, some thought it was crazy to think she could come back. But after this successful reconnection with her fans, 
It may be crazier to think that she can't. A writer for the Daily 49er then said that Britney's entrance to the stage prompted some of the loudest screams and cheers they had ever heard in a House of Blues venue. Oh, Even in the positive reviews, there were of course some backhanded compliments. And certainly not everything said about the show was super positive or kind. For example, every single publication's review for the show that I could find mentions Britney's weight at least once. Whether to say she still has a few pounds of mama weight on her, or that there was no evidence of the weight gain that landed her on celebrity tabloid covers last year. USA Today wrote, All those post-rehab workouts were worth the effort. The only trace of flab was her stomach, which was a bit pudgy. And one of the fans USA Today quoted from that night said, I'm so excited right now. She looks so beautiful, so skinny. And of course, because it was 2007, there were people who participated in the spectacle for the sole purpose of making fun of Britney. One attendee told the LA Times, I've known her since her first record and I kind of grew out of it, but I really wanna see her wig fall off. Another piece from USA Today wrote, two teenage girls stood outside the club's front entrance and didn't even try to get in. Christina Farrell, clad in an ACDC t-shirt, said she had come to make fun of the preps. I've never been a fan of Britney, and I never will be. Her friend Elaine Daner, in a social distortion shirt, agreed. I listen to rock, she said. I don't like the cheese. And like, okay, if you really want to make this a battle between rock music and pop music over which is the cheesiest or the most commercial, Guess which genre holds the most merchandised musical act of all time? The group has played the marketing game perhaps better than any band in history. Even Baby Club. <laughs> and now boasts some 3,000 different pieces of merchandise. Sorry, that just annoyed me. What also annoyed me was the very unnecessary swipe that Fallout Boy took at Britney at one of their own shows in May of 2007. When Pete Wentz said on stage, when we thought about doing this, we were talking about doing a 15 minute lip syncing set, but then we realized that Patrick can actually sing and that I just got out of rehab. Patrick Stump then added, I forgot my go-go boots. The bands never addressed that not so subtle shade at Britney, probably because most people don't know about it, but I do. However, Pete Wentz said in an interview with Nylon in 2018, To me, Britney Spears is a mirror we hold up to pop culture. We build her up, tear her down, root for or against her. I think it says so much more about us as a culture than it does about Britney herself. And sure, Pete, us as a culture, no one has any individual culpability whatsoever. I've always been team Britney, so. Whatever. It's not like it's the worst thing a public figure said about Britney, especially in 2007. And I certainly understand why a 15-minute lip-synced set could disappoint some fans. But like, it was a $35 show? Yes, a lot of the people who were there paid more, but that wasn't Britney's fault. She was charging. $35. Adjusted for inflation, that's like 50 bucks in 2023. And $50 to even be in the same room as one of the biggest pop stars in the world is kind of a good deal. There are clubs in LA that pay more for a cover fee, and Britney Spears isn't even in those buildings. And yes, she may not have sung live, but she did dance live. And for the first time in three years, after a surgery on her knee. Now, some people have tried to blame that knee injury for the noticeable change in Britney's dance skills since 2004, but I think there's quite a lot of evidence that the knee wasn't the problem. A lot of Britney's performances post-conservatorship have lacked in energy, but definitely not all of them. In the decade following 2008, there have absolutely been performances where Britney's dancing abilities are about what they were at her quote-unquote peak. And the difference between those performances and the less spectacular ones 
is usually just the energy. It's incredibly easy to tell when Britney is actually feeling a performance and when she's just going through the motions with a plastered on smile. And in 2007, during the Eminem tour, so after the knee injury, but before the conservatorship that would effectively remove her right to decide when and where she would be on stage, Britney was definitely feeling her performances. A through line throughout all of the positive fan reaction to the M&M's tour is that Britney, even in the midst of some of the most chaotic moments of her life, looked happy to be on stage. And unfortunately for years after that tour, that wasn't always the case. My management said, if I don't do this tour, I will have to find an attorney and by contract, my own management could sue me if I didn't follow through with the tour. He handed me a sheet of paper as I got off the stage in Vegas and said I had to sign it. It was very threatening and scary. And with the conservatorship, I couldn't even get my own attorney. So out of fear, I went ahead and I did the tour. When I came off that tour, a new show in Las Vegas was supposed to take place. I started rehearsing early, but it was hard because I'd been doing Vegas for four years and I needed a break in between. But no, I was told this is the timeline and this is how it's gonna go. My performances I know were horrible. Like I even wore wigs and all the dancers were doing all these nice sexy head flip turns and I had conditioner treatment in my hair and like these little um, caps over my head and just during a whole show getting conditioner treatments just with wigs on because I was just like a robot. Honestly, I just, I didn't give a fuck anymore because I couldn't go where I wanted to go. I couldn't have the nannies that I wanted to have. I couldn't have cash. Um, and it was just demoralizing. So I was kind of like in this conspiracy thing of people claiming and like treating me like a superstar, but yet they treated me like nothing. But some things have remained true all these years later. Number one, Britney is still as enigmatic as ever. Fans are constantly trying to decipher her social media posts and these little words and titles she uses with little to no explanation. Like right now, her name on Instagram is Maria River Red. And like, what? What does that mean? No one knows. Just like no one really knows what Eminem stands for. A lot of people in the standum will say that it stands for mother and miss, referencing the fact that Britney was a new mother and newly single following her divorce from K-Fed. And given my inclination to find dichotomies in Britney's work, I would love to just accept that as the definitive answer, but I can't find a single citing source for it. It's just something that fans have been saying for years and I can't for the life of me find where this explanation originated, and believe me, I have looked. So there's that. 2007, 2023, we're still just kind of guessing what Britney is trying to tell us. And then the second thing we can get from this is that Britney just likes performing. She likes being creative, even when she's completely burnt out from the industry that she's been a part of since 1998, or even earlier if you count her Mickey Mouse Club days like when she kept writing on her website in 2004 that she was gonna take a break from work, then choreographed and co-directed her own music video a few months later, even when she had to fight her label to allow her to do it. Since she debuted, Britney Spears has been conceptualized as this archetypal manufactured blonde pop star who only does what her record label tells her and whose artistry is always caked in grand spectacles and big budget productions. As if this isn't a woman who walked into a radio station with a CD to play a raw demo of her new song against her record label's wishes. Or like she isn't someone who planned a mini House of Blues tour for herself while she didn't even have a manager because she just wanted to dance on stage in a tiny outfit for 15 minutes. Cause even now, while she's effectively retired from the music industry since her conservatorship ended, she's doing makeshift photo shoots with her iPhone in her house. She's uploading videos of her dancing in her living room. She's doing new acapella renditions of her own songs and sharing poems she wrote. Oh baby, baby, how was I supposed to know that something wasn't right here? Britney Spears is a creative person who likes performing for an audience beyond the pageantry of Britney Spears, the pop star. 
Currently, there are rumors about her being in talks with Sony Music to produce a new album, and I've seen other rumors recently about her potentially being in talks for a new Vegas residency, and I don't know if any of that is true. I don't know if Britney has any interest in ever being the spectacle-driven pop star that she was in the early 2000s and that she was resigned to be again throughout her conservatorship. As a fan of spectacle-driven pop music, I think it'd be amazing if she did want to resume her career in that way, especially because I would love to see a newly freed Britney's take on it. But even if she never releases an album again, or she never embarks on a tour or a residency, if she never performs at an award show or attends a red carpet, I feel pretty confident saying that she's gonna continue making and doing stuff, even if it's just little videos dancing in her living room, or poems she deletes from her social media after a couple hours. Who knows, maybe if we're patient, she'll get that same itch to go and travel and perform in front of her fans, like she told People Magazine she was getting in 2006. Maybe she'll finally direct that musical about Hollywood, or release songs from the original doll. I don't know, but the nice part about it is, anything Britney does in the future now will be her decision. Whether it's an iffy decision, like getting hitched to a guy she barely knows from her hometown, or a brilliant decision like changing the video treatment for Baby One More Time, which kind of changed pop culture forever. One thing we do know is that Britney Spears will always be dancing in a small outfit somewhere at some point in the near future. And I think that's beautiful. You took a year off show business. Mm -hmm. uh, what way have you grown as a person in that year? Well, I don't think I necessarily took a year off. I took my like four weeks off, and then I went back in the studio. So um, if you call that being off, um, I just kind of took time out for myself in, in the fact of recording on my schedule instead of, you know, being there at a certain time or whatever. I just kind of, yeah, did it on my terms, which was cool.